Pygame, along with some other low-level frameworks, have had a bit of a resurgence lately. In fact, the winner of the last Ludum Dare, one of the biggest game jams out there, was using Pygame. Pygame has frequently appeared in the top placements recently, including one of my own games. With a lot of more experienced developers showing interest in Pygame now, I figured it'd be a good time to make a tutorial slash overview focused on summarizing what Pygame is and what features are in its API. Some of you more experienced developers may be able to watch this video then jump straight into making full games with Python with just a little bit of help from the docs. So let's jump into it. First, Pygame is not a game engine. It handles basic graphics operations for 2D games, input, audio, window management, and a few other things. It does not, for example, have built-in physics, particle, or even camera systems. Most of the graphical legwork is done by simply putting an image on the screen at given coordinates. Most games are primarily built from functions like these, so you have to be creative about how you use these features. It's also worth noting that Pygame primarily renders on the CPU, which means that there's not a whole lot going on under the hood, and the render calls are super simple. But the drawing performance isn't quite as good as what you'd get with OpenGL. It's more than sufficient for most 2D games, though. See my performance video for more details on that subject. To install Pygame, just install pygame-ce with pip, which is usually just pip3 install pygame-ce. The original package was just Pygame, but due to some open source drama, most of the contributors were forced to start a second repository with a fork, which has now significantly surpassed the original repository. It has more features and better performance while being fully compatible with old Pygame code, so there isn't much of a reason to not use Pygame CE. Since this video is meant for more experienced developers, I won't go into the details about everything that can go wrong with pip installs, since that's just general Python stuff you can Google. Before you can put an image on the screen, you need a window. Creating a window is simple. First, import Pygame and initialize it. Then use display.setMode to create a window with the dimensions of the window provided as a tuple. Everything graphical in Pygame revolves around surfaces, which is basically just a term for an image in memory. Display.setMode returns a surface, which is actually the image in memory that ends up being shown on the screen for the user to see. If you run this code, you'll see a window pop up and disappear. Running all the way through a script will cause everything to close, so making games at this level requires you to write the game loop itself. A game loop is a task that continuously runs and handles everything that a game needs, from rendering and entity updates to input processing. We can implement this as a while loop, but intuitively we also need a way to close the game. Running this infinite loop gives us a window that we can't close by clicking on X. Window and input related events are accessible through the event module. Event.get gives you a list of all the events that occurred since the last time it was called. I can't cover all the event types here, but they are listed in the event documentation. Different events have different attributes, so normally you match the event type first in a loop, then handle them accordingly. In our case, we'll want to use a quit event first to detect the window closing. We can use this to set running to false when detected, and we can use pygame.quit to clean everything up. Now the window closes nicely when we press X. With a functional window, we can put an image on the screen. Intuitively, we need to somehow turn an image file on our computer into a Pygame surface since an image in memory is essentially a surface. This is what pygame.image.load is for. We just give it a path and it returns a surface made from the file we gave it. Interestingly, surfaces can have different pixel formats associated with them. To use the fastest one for rendering, we should use .convert on the surface when we load it. With our surface ready, we can put it onto the screen with .blit. Using the blit function of a surface will put the surface given in the blit arguments onto the surface from which blit was being called at the given coordinates. In this case we're putting our potato image on the special surface shown in the window with a position that moves one pixel on the x-axis every single time the game does a loop. Contrary to what you're taught in math classes, the coordinate system in Pygame has positive x going right and positive y going down. This is because the top left corner of the window is in the position 00. zero. Finally, we need to call pygame.display.flip, which just takes whatever we've put on the special screen surface and actually shows it on the window. This makes sense if you think about it, since you wouldn't want some halfway rendered scene appearing. We need to tell Pygame when we're done rendering a frame for the game. Something you may have to get used to thinking about is how games are rendered in discrete frames. Movement is an illusion made up of many small changes to what's rendered. Running the code will show a tiny potato fly quickly to the right while creating a trail. There's a couple of things to learn here. First, the game will run as fast as possible and must slow down. To fix this, we can create a time.clock and call clock.tick after rendering with our desired frame rate. 60 FPS is the maximum of your average monitor, but you may want to go faster for some displays. 
This rendering system also means that the faster the game runs, the faster a potato will move. You could just lock the game to 60 FPS and assume nobody has a high refresh rate monitor or lags to make the potato run faster or slower than 60 pixels per second, but the standard solution is to measure the time between frames, referred to as delta time, and multiply time-dependent math by the duration of the last frame to make things like motion consistent even when frame rates are varying. We'll want to scale the motion of our potato in this case. Clock.tick actually returns the time in milliseconds, which can be used, however, you will likely want to handle edge cases like zero or cap it so it doesn't go too high if there's a stutter. Since clock.tick only has millisecond precision, it may be nicer in some cases to measure using time.time .time since it's more precise, but millisecond precision is sufficient here. Now let's address the trail of potato pixels. This is because the surface we're rendering onto doesn't get cleared when calling display.flip. Since a blit is a memory copy, whatever is blit last will appear on top. In this case, the new potato hides all but the leftmost pixels. So it's important to ensure objects are rendered in the correct order. You cannot specify a Z component or a layer when you're blitting, but you can write your own system that implements those features. In this case though, we just need to clear out our background. Surfaces have a .fill function to fill the surface with the given RGB or RGB color of pixels. We could fill our potato surface if we wanted, but we want to fill the window surface. I've chosen white, which has an RGB value of 255, 255, 255. Finally, we want our potato to be bigger since it's pixel art. To change the size of a surface, we can use one of the many surface transform functions that Pygame provides. In this case, we will want transform.scale but there are also flip, rotate, and many other transforms listed in the documentation. You can play around with those other functions in your own time. Transform.scale takes in a new size in pixels, so if we want to double the size of our potato, we can access the width and height of the original surface and multiply them by two in our scale transform. The returned surface is the surface with the transform applied. In case you didn't catch it, one pixel in a source image is one pixel in a surface loaded from an image, and therefore one pixel on the window, at least until we just scaled it here. Running the code again gives us a potato moving at a reasonable 50 pixels per second over a white background. However, we have black corners on our potato. To fix this, there are a couple solutions. First, if you're using a source image with an alpha layer with a transparent background, you'll want to use .convert alpha instead of .convert to tell Pygame that the pixel format needs to support pixel level transparency. In our case though, the image actually has black in it instead of a transparent background, so we can just use .setColor key to tell Pygame which color to ignore when blitting. Run the code again and you'll see that the corners are gone. Before we move on, I should add that there's actually a couple different techniques for rendering pixel art. You can scale all the individual assets and render them like we are now, which gives smoother movement but not all the images will be pixel aligned unless you force them to be. The other solution, which is generally more performant in busy scenes, is to render at the low resolution your pixel art is suited for and scale it up. In newer versions of Pygame, this can be done using the scaled flag when creating the window, often used alongside the sizable flag. The older method that I use in my other tutorials is to create another surface representing the base resolution of the game. Then render pixel art assets like the potato to that surface without scaling. Finally, you can scale up that intermediate surface before blitting it onto the window surface with a much larger resolution based on the window itself. It's very important to remember that you don't have to just blit images you loaded from a file straight onto the screen. Blank surfaces can be created with pygame.surface, which default to black or fully transparent if you use pygame.src-alpha. You can blit any surface to any other surface, which means you can create a multi-potato surface first before rendering it to the screen. You can also get or set any individual pixel within a surface, but doing so at scale may not be performant. Lots of fancy effects and performance improvements can be achieved through creative uses of surfaces. If you want an interesting example, you can check out my palette swapping video where I do palette swaps using color keys and surface tricks. One more useful feature is the set alpha function that sets the overall transparency of a surface. You could use this to fade out an image by changing the alpha value over time. I'd recommend checking out the surface documentation for a full list of features. All that said, you may want some more tools to your graphical tool belt than just making collages of images you loaded from files. Pygame can also draw various shapes to surfaces with the draw submodule and create surfaces with rendered text using the font submodule. 
For text rendering, it's as simple as creating a font object from a TTF file, system font name, or just letting it use the default, and using the font.render function to turn a string of text into a surface with text on it, with the given anti-aliasing and color settings. By default, the surface will have a transparent background even though it's rectangular in shape as all surfaces are, so we can blend it straight onto the screen surface. There are loads of other text-related features if you look through the font documentation. As I mentioned before, Pygame doesn't have a built-in physics system. You have to code it yourself. It provides rectangle math with overlap detection, and the rest is left to you. If you want pixel-level collision detection, or you just really want to do some advanced graphical tricks, you can use masks, which are a more complicated topic that I have a dedicated video on, or you can read the docs. Pygame's recs are often sufficient for many different types of games if you do a little bit of tinkering. First, let's give our potato a hitbox by creating a rect at its location based on the size of the image every frame. Note that the arguments are the top left x and y, then the x and y size of the rect. Now we can create something for the potato to collide with. Let's just make another rect at 300x and give it some arbitrary size. Pygame's draw.rect function takes in a rect object, which is slightly unusual since the other shapes, like lines or polygons, don't have a line or polygon object. For those, you just put the shape attributes straight into the draw function parameters. In this case, the fact that it takes a rect object is convenient because we can render our second hitbox. It just needs to know the destination surface to draw the shape on, the color we want, and the rect object itself. Let's put in yellow as default. We can do a collision detection between the two hitboxes with the rect's dot collide rect function. Unlike blit, the order doesn't matter since it's just a boolean outcome. Multiplying the red component by the collision boolean will show us whether the collision has occurred through the color that we render the rect with. Running the code again shows us the rect going from green to yellow when the potato touches it. If you want collision resolution and not just detection for rectangles, you can check out my now 6 year old video on implementing physics with rectangles. It's a general technique that works for any number of dimensions and any lower level physics system even outside of Pygame. Interestingly, most of the techniques you'll run into when using Pygame are applicable to other low level graphics setups for game programming such as SDL, which Pygame is a wrapper for, OpenGL, SFML, and more. This is because the tools you use when using Pygame are so low level that almost everything else shares similar fundamental functionality. It's all about how you use the tools. If you want to make a game where you use the mouse, there are some useful features for that too. There's a mouse submodule where you can mess with the cursor and get the current state. A lot of this information also appears as events from the event.get call, but oftentimes the mouse submodule is more convenient. In our case, let's take the mouse position and use the rect.collide point function to test for a mouse collision with a rect. Similar to the other collision, let's multiply the green component so we can see what type of collision occurred. Now we can change the color of the rect in multiple ways. There's a lot of useful stuff that comes through the event queue. One of the most useful is keyboard input. There is a get pressed function for keys if you want to look into that method, but I'll use the event queue for this example. We can check for the key down and key up events with the event.key attribute of k underscore d, which is the d key, to set a balloon for the d key state. Then just gate the movement of the potato behind a check to see if d is pressed, and we have movement based on keyboard input. There's a lot of keys that Pygame supports, and it's one of the things I'll often have to check the documentation for since there are so many, since the keys are just represented by constant. There's also functions you can use to convert a character into the associated key if you need to. There's one final core feature that you'll likely need for most games, sound. At its most basic level, you can just create a sound object from a file with a supported audio type and call dot play. There are some features like looping and fade in the play parameters, and if you want to set the volume for a sound, you can use sound.setVolume, but if you want to get into spatial audio or dynamic volume, you'll want to control the individual audio channels that sounds play in. It's worth noting that spatial audio is only available in Pygame CE. I won't go into depth here since the documentation is quite helpful, but sounds are played inside channels, and channels have their own set of functions that apply to that audio channel and not everywhere that the sound is being used, which is why they're distinct. For many games, you'll probably want to increase the maximum number of audio channels with set num channels as well. Let's hook up our sound effect to the key F in our event loop, and now we can hear our sound whenever F is pressed. If you want to play music, there's also the entire mixer.music submodule, but it can only play one thing at a time. 
Between the music player and sound outplay, simple games should easily be covered without much effort. Things get a little bit more complicated if you want spatial or dynamic audio, but it's still all Python and doesn't end up being too challenging to manage channels. Finally, there are some extra submodules worth looking into depending on what you're doing. The sprite submodule helps you manage groups of entities and collisions, but it's all stuff you can do with lists, recs, and a bunch of blitz, so I've actually never used it. There's also joystick and controller modules for messing with controller input. For games, you'll usually want to use the controller module. There are also some submodules for dealing with surface data and conversions. If, for example, you wanted to convert between images or textures and other libraries like PIL or OpenGL, you'll need access to the raw surface data. Now, if you pause and think about it, you should have all the tools you need to make pretty much any 2D game. You can transform and render with images, draw abstract shapes, handle text, detect collisions, process user input, and play sounds. Everything else is just built up creatively from there. For example, you might be wondering how you would have a full game world when there's no camera system. The camera submodule was for webcams and not cameras. <laughs> if you think about what happens on the screen when a game camera moves, it just moves everything on the screen in the opposite direction of the virtual camera. So if you want a big world, you'll be moving everything on the screen to create your own camera instead of using some pre-built system. Everything is built up in this way where you'll have to think about what actually happens at a very low level for various game features before implementing it yourself. If you want some examples, I have longer tutorials that have actual projects, plus all of my games have source code included if you want to see how my games work. I also have an old video about Pygame's performance you can watch if you're curious about that topic. Just ignore what I said about shaders since they're doable if you mix in some OpenGL. The core ideas for getting good performance are mostly just revolving around making sure that you only render what's on screen and optimizing data access while caching when beneficial. You may have to get into some data structures and algorithms to get the best results. You can use as much or as little of Pygame as you want in combination with many other things. For example, you can make 3D games by just using Pygame for its window input and audio while hooking onto an OpenGL context with ModernGL or PyOpenGL for rendering. I oftentimes mix Pygame and OpenGL rendering for post-processing shaders, which I have a video on. If you want a full-fledged physics engine to use inside Pygame, you can use something like PyMonk or PyBullet. Since Python is pretty much the general purpose programming language, there are an absurd amount of modules that you have direct access to while making games with Pygame in case you want to do something super funky. Personally, I haven't had a reason to use anything other than Pygame for 2D projects since I've built up my own tooling on top of Pygame over the years. If you run my games, you'll find that the performance is not an issue either. Writing code in Python is super easy, so development goes quite fast once you get the hang of things, which is why Pygame has done well in competitions like the Loom Dare recently. Anyways, I hope this video served as a useful overview of Pygame for you, and if you want to check out Yanok, my new game made with Python and Pygame, there will be a link in the description. I've also left a link for the code written in this video in case you were just watching or have a typo in your code. Thanks for watching!